So welcome to this house of books. Today we're observing the 10th anniversary of Craig Lancaster's book, Summer Sun. Craig's with us along with fellow writer, Gwen Florio. Craig and Gwen are both well-respected journalists who are also prolific award-winning novelists. And not to distract from the topic of the day, but both have some new work coming out. Uh, Gwen's new book will be officially released in February and has already received a star from Kirkus, uh, marking the book as having exceptional merit. And I know a little less about Craig's book and when it's going to come out, but we're looking forward, I think, in May. Is that right, Craig? May, correct. May, okay. And I know we'll be more uh, hearing more about it later in this discussion. So um, what I'm going to do right now is just turn the microphone over to Craig and Gwen and just get out of the way. Great. Okay. What I'd like to hear from Craig first, because this is marking 10 years of the summer sun. And <laughs> contrary to what a lot of people believe about books, when you publish them, you go on Oprah and you make a ton of money. And <laughs> the summer right. sun was not an instant success, but it's had a lot of staying power. Can you talk about its journey? Yeah, it's been more durable than, you know, um, than any kind of superstar book. Um, I, I was writing it, my, my first book, um, 600 Hours of Edward came out in late 2009. And I had been writing The Summer Sun all of that year and on into uh, 2010. And, you know, I, was, I wasn't sure what was gonna happen with it. I, I wasn't sure how committed my publisher at the time was to doing another book because he doesn't do a whole lot of fiction. And uh, um, and then I, I found out from him that um, one of the Amazon imprints had come sniffing around the first book, and he had told them, you know, that he wasn't interested. But he suggested that I talk to them about my second book, and so I did. I I cold called them, and you know, in about eight days, I had a publishing contract, which was just kind of bizarre, and it's. It's kind of worked that way my my entire career you know it's it's always been some open door you know down below the stairs that I've worked my way in you know and so so when I get asked well how do you get published I I have no idea because it keeps happening in all these weird ways um but anyway it came out in January of 2011 and it's um had a couple of good months and then just kind of disappeared. I, I think I talked to, to you about how, like in June or July of that year, I think it sold something like 42 copies, all territories, all formats. And I was just like, God, I'm so dead. You know, like it's the dream lasted for two books and that's it because, you know, I'm radioactive now. And uh, um, that turned out not to be the case. I mean, it, uh, you know, it's, it got picked up for a couple of foreign translations, which I was thrilled with because it was it all seemed like gravy to me. And, uh, and it just kind of has steadily sold all these years later. I'm, and every now and then, every now and then, not very often. I mean, most, mostly I hear from, you know, people about 600 hours of Edward, which I totally get and I'm totally fine with. But every now and then somebody will say, boy, you know, Summer Sun, that was my favorite. And I, I just, I just want to kiss them, you know, uh, I mean, chastely, of course, but, uh, you know. Well, yeah. and, and now, you know, with the pandemic, you could just kind of blow. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I can, yeah. I can do those all day long, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, um, I have my own ideas about the enduring appeal of the book, but I'm curious to hear what you think it is. Then we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> well, okay, well, I have, first I should say that I, of all the books I've written, and I try, I really do try not not to go back and Monday morning quarterback them, you know. Uh, I think only writers understand that by the time you're done and it's out, it's like, let me move on to something else, you know, and so, um, but of the books that I've written, it is the one that if I were doing it now at age 50 instead of then at age 39, I would, uh, I would write a little bit differently. And, uh, but 
that said, I think what it has going for it is it is this enormously honest story with a real big heart at the center of it. And, um, and I think that's what causes people to keep, you know, stumbling over it or connecting with it when they do, um, you know, and it was, I wasn't, I didn't know enough to be guarded about it. You know, I just sort of dropped it out there. So. It feels um, so true of families in general. I think it's really universal in that regard uh, yeah. because families, you know, the people you love the most or can be the people you hate the most <laughs> and the people who can hurt you the most. And yeah. um, it, I, I imagine it resonates across ages and gender and everything. Uh, one of the other things it does, um, you get into, and, and this sort of leads into something we're going to be talking about also tonight, um, the geography of the West. You know, you talk, right. you describe Billings in really beautiful terms, and a lot of people don't think of Billings as, as a beautiful place, but you find the, be the beauty in Billings, yeah. and then also the landscape in Utah, which is pretty stark and, and pretty different, so... Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to fight anybody who doesn't think Billings is beautiful. Now, now if all they're doing is coming in on I-90 and driving past the refinery, then I totally get it. But if you if you get off into the uh, into the town, um, you know, I I love living here. I've always I've always loved Billings, and when I say always, I mean when I was a little kid and we would come up here on vacation because I had an aunt and uncle who lived here. Um, you know, Billings always has meant a lot to me. Um, the Utah part of it is kind of interesting because um, the part of Utah that the book takes place in, I spent the summer when I was nine years old in that place, in that little town, Milford, uh, with my dad who did what the father in uh, the book does. He was a uh, he was a oil man, you know, I mean, he wasn't digging for oil. He was digging for, uh, he was doing test shots for uranium and natural gas, but, you know, it was still the same thing. It was, you know, extraction. Um, so, um, you know, uh, that, that thematically that t tends to show up in short stories. It certainly showed up in that novel. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new novel later on. There's there's a guy who's connected to an extractive in industry there, which is so funny because you know in in those terms I'm like a good liberal, right? Like I, I want alternative fuel sources and all this, but I know I know the people who make their living that way. I've always known them. I uh, grew up around them, and so so that that's in there as well. Which again ties into the theme of talking about literature of the West. I think a lot of it involves working class people and, and sort of the stereotype, you know, or the ranchers and, and the right. lone wolves out here, but also people on the pipelines, um, a lot of construction industry, that sort of thing. Yeah. And they're doing their jobs in places with pretty unforgiving climates a lot. Yeah, I love the, the climates and, you know, um, and environments, you know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, um, one of the things I find fa fascinating about Montana and why I'm sort of watching with this trepidation as our housing prices go into the stratosphere is that Montana, even when I moved here in 2006, was not, um, terribly affordable to a lot of Montanans, you know, they're all, they're all working two jobs, three jobs, you know, stretching, 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 and it's getting worse. And, uh, you know, that, uh, I think it's part of what makes, you know, the people who really treasure this state, um, it's part of what makes them the way they are, you know, you have to, you have to work pretty hard to be here. And, and to stay and, and, and to be a part of it, so. When I first, so I moved here just a year before you did. And when I met the man who's now my partner, he advised me, uh, he 
said people will be standoffish at first because they'll want to yeah. see if you stick. They're going to want to see if you make it through that first winter. Right. And then if you do, right. maybe, maybe make it through a couple of winters, they'll figure you're, you're going to be here a while. So my um, kind of my snotty hope with some of these people is winter will hit and they'll go, never mind. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, I don't know how permanent this change is, but it feels like we're really going through something significant right now. It, it does. It does. I mean, I, and it's all over the country, you know, like <laughs> real estate is just being plucked up and, and it's, it's, I just, I, I don't know where it ends, you know, like we're, we're so grateful that when we came back to Montana or, or last year, mm -hmm. uh, now that we're in 2021, <laughs> that we still had a house here. Cause I don't know that we could have bought to get back in it, you know? And, uh, so, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very interesting in that way. I had actually, before I moved to Montana, I had lived another place that's very similar uh, in, in the way that you're describing. I, I lived in Alaska and, you know, a good chunk of my mid-20s, early 20s, and then I went back and sort of my mid to late 20s. And um, Alaskans were, well, a lot of them came from somewhere else. You know, they came from, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Minnesotans, a lot of Texans, you know, you, you run into uh, all kinds. Um, but people were, they give you a little bit of that, you know, long arm, like, okay, all right. But once you were in, it was just, you know, the best friends you could have ever asked for in your whole life. Montana's the same way. Montana, Montana will, will wait you out a little bit, you know, but man, once you've got a friend in Montana, you've got a friend in Montana. And it's yeah. it's unlike anywhere else I've ever lived in that regard. So. Yeah, it, it really grabs you and holds on hard. Yeah, yeah, um, it does. Although with the, the changes we're seeing, we were talking just a little while ago about books like Max, Max Lostikoff's new one. Well, not only his new one, but his collection of short stories, the effects of the changes, especially the financial ones on this state of the people who've lived here a long time and suddenly finding that they can't afford to keep living here yeah. or they're getting shut out of a lot of the things and places that they loved. And um, I'm wondering if you see that in other books also, you know, the, the literature of the West that's coming up now. You know, um, Ruthie Fear, the first book that you, I, that's one that um, is in the stack for me. I, I really want to read it. Um, you know, to some degree, and I, I'm I'm not I'm not an expert on um, you know people movement through Montana. Um, I would probably defer to my friend uh, Scott McMillian on that. Um, but it does feel like we fight these battles uh, continually. You know, who. Who says what about Montana? Who's calling the shots? Who's you know? And we, and we, and we climb on top of it. You know, we 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 write a constitution that is uh, uh, among the most transparent constitutions anywhere in the United States. We uh, we strike blows for public access to the land, which is such a huge thing here. But you know, the fight is never won because there's always somebody ready to chip it away or sell it or whatever. And, you know, and we're entering a time where it seems like we're gonna have to fight again, you know, just to, yeah. just to keep what, what so many of us think is special about the place. Um, you know. What is it about this place that makes it so irresistible to writers, both as a place to live and then as a subject? I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I really don't. I, I, I would like to have a good answer about it because I was aware of it as, as early as 17 years old when I was reading a lot of Hemingway's, shows, you know, and, and real had it and, you know, Idaho and Wyoming had imprinted themselves on him. And the best I've ever come, been able to come up with is that there's, there's a certain clarity of thought and purpose and why am I doing what I'm doing when you stand there and let yourself be swallowed up by it 
and you realize how insignificant you are relative to what it is you're staring at. You know, you just, I, I am not, I was laughing with uh, Joe Wilkins about this. Um, you know, Joe Wilkins, uh, Fall Down When I Die, you know, which is just a fantastic novel set in the Blue Mountains. I was laughing with him about this and I said, you know, I love the hard earth books. I do. I love them. But but it seems absurd for me to even try to write one. You know, it just doesn't <laughs> I I don't I can't go deep on it like like he can, you know. Um like uh um I'm 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 going to fumble about here, but um you know, um there's just so many so many authors, uh, a lot of them who are at the top top of their game right now, yeah, who who get it. And I read them so I can draw in that knowledge, you know. I'm much more likely to write a book about a guy who uh, orders a pizza, which, <laughs> which is funny because um, Tom McGuane joked about that. Like he said, I just want to see a book written in Montana where there's a pizza delivery. <laughs> and I had written that book, so I sent it to him and I mentioned it to him one time. And and he was like, "Oh God, I never saw it. It was, you know, because he gets so many, right, so many packages every day. It was just languishing somewhere in a room where, where it had gotten tossed. But you know, there you go. But it's out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. I know when I first moved here, that or I think even before I moved here, but the first time I saw Butte, I was just like. Oh my God, this place is amazing. What a great place to set a book. It's just <laughs> perfect. And then I got here and in short order realized how very particular people are about Butte. I thought, oh, yeah. I will never set a book in Butte. <laughs> you yeah, know, well, and, you get one and, thing and, wrong and you're dead. <laughs> and some people, you know, and, and some people go to it again and again. You know, like I, one of my dearest friends was Richard Wheeler, um, who died here in the last right. couple of years. And, and um, you know, after a lot of books have been written about the hit, richest hill on earth, he went ahead and wrote a book called The Richest Hill on Earth. And <laughs> it, was, it was as good as any of them and better than a lot. And I just couldn't, um, that, I, I, I would shy away from that. I'd be like, you know, I wonder what's going on in Wilsall, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of Butte, one of the things I've enjoyed most this year has been the juxtaposition. I was listening to the new podcast, Death in the West, which right. is fabulous. And the Chad centers, Dundas thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it centers on the murder of Frank Little, which a ton has been written about, but, you know, looks at it in a new way and in a very different format. But then um, I also read um, Jess Walters' The Cold Millions, Right. Uh, which involves the same time period or roughly the same time period, a lot of the same characters and issues. And, and just it was a little before, farther west, right? Spokane. Yeah, Spokane. Yeah. So yeah. it was such a joy to have those two things kind of back to back um, and, and that work so perfectly together. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, um, one thing uh, that I think I knew implicitly when I was younger and was first starting to get into reading fiction. But, um, you know, if you really want to know um, a place, see what a good fiction writer has done with it, you know? Uh, and I, 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 think, I think that's true, you know? Um, any example? Whether, I'm going to put that? you on the spot now. Oh, no, I mean, you know, uh, I... <laughs> well, I mean, I just got done living in Maine last year, right? So, so um, Stephen King, I totally get now why all these, you know, everything that scared him <laughs> sets in Maine, um, and and not because it was intimidating or anything like that, but you could just see how I could just see living there and the way. The way things are and the, how spread out and how isolated everything is that that he saw these wide openings to send monsters into you know while people uh confronted all the things about them and their place that allowed that to flourish you know uh, so 
Yeah, I mean, that's just an example right off the top of my head, but I knew rural Montana before I started exploring it by reading Ivan Doy, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, and that was so funny because I was coming to Montana it was uh, summer of 89, so I was 19 years old. I had just done a bunch of assignments for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. They had done this advertising insert, and somebody, some publisher in one of the bureaus had told these advertisers that they would get little write-ups, and uh, an editorial wanted no <laughs> part of that. And so my boss, I was just a stringer, and my boss was like, I'll pay you $5 per to write, you know, 75 or 80 words about each one of these advertisers. And so, so I had, I just had as much money as I'd ever seen. It didn't seem like that much money anymore. And I got in the car and drove to Montana and the boss who had hooked me up with this gig said, oh my gosh, you're going to Montana. Well, you should, you should totally read some Ivan Doig. I'd never heard of him. And then that was just like throwing open a whole door to, you know, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah. people really write this way, you know, it, it, it yeah. seems unbelievable to me. So when I worked in Philadelphia for the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, we had two professors from the University of Montana Journalism School come work there on the copy desk on alternate summers. Back in the day, I think there was a mandate that if you taught at the J School, you had to do some working journalism every right. so often to keep your hand in. And so um, it was Dennis Twybold and Carol Van Valkenburg. Oh, wow. Who oh, yeah. become wonderful friends over the many, many years now. But they introduced me. I think it was their fault that I, I think I may have started with this House of Sky and then moved on to Jim Welch and God help us. I had to read A River Runs Through It, et cetera. So sure. long before I ever even set foot in this state, I had gone on this Montana reading binge and um, had that same sense that you very wonderfully described when I got here of your very, very small in this huge place, yeah. but then also your spirit expands right? because of that. But the longer I've lived here, um, the more Montana has felt smaller to me because of that, that same neighborliness that you described. Um, yeah. You know, you go anywhere in the state, we, we play what people call the Montana game. Who do you know who I know? Right, right. You know, yeah. You breathe yeah. the separation. And uh, yeah, it's one of the many things I love about it. Out here. Well, who, who described it as a small town with really long streets? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's so funny when um, Elisa and I got together, um, which would have been uh, summer of 2015. Better remember. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I got it. I got it. I just have to place it, you know, I have to place it. There's like, there's the divorce. Here's that, you know, but uh, um, so when she came out of here, every inch we drove west was Terra Nova to her. She had never been west uh -huh. of Chicago. And so the early in that summer, we drove to Seattle with stops along the way. I think we saw you and Scott mm -hmm. and um, um, Sherry Devlin, I think. Uh, I can't remember. No, 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 it was Barbara Thoreau. But anyway, right. yeah. And um, um, so it was just so funny to watch Elisa's eyes, like she was following a tennis match because she didn't know where to look as we drove west. And you know, right about Columbus, she was like, this is incredible. Oh my God. And I was just like, you haven't even, you, right. like, you don't wait. even know, you do not even know what's coming for you. You know, I mean, not that Columbus isn't lovely. It is, but you know, in terms it's of, more. Grandeur, you, yeah, you've still got, you've still got the real stuff. So, yeah. So I'm going to go back to the books for a second. Okay, after sure. the Summer Sun, what, what was your publishing journey after that? Because you have published in lots of different ways. And, and I think it's really good for other writers to hear how um, haphazard is a bad word, but it feels like that kind of with the number of writers I know. Um, yeah. like that a door opens. Who knew that door was even there? And the next thing you know, here's another book. Yeah, I so... 
after the summer sun, I did do, um, I did a collection of short stories and I did that myself through my own little boutique um, press. I, I now, I have, I have uh, repurposed the word boutique from, you know, small to me and me alone. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so, um, and, and part of the reason that I did that is because short stories are such a, I mean, I don't write them very often. I had that year, 2010, I wrote a bunch of them and there were a lot of reasons for that. But, um, you know, sort of two ways you can go at it. You know, you can submit to these literary journals and wait for them to come out and then approach a publisher and say, hey, I've been published in, you know, all these fine literary journals and, um, or you just do it yourself. And I wanted, I didn't have the patience for that. Um, so I did that and then um, I wrote the sequel to 600 Hours of Edward. And I really, really, really wanted to, um, not that I had anything against my Montana publisher, just everything seemed pretty small. And, you know, I'd done this thing with Amazon, which was bigger and I was selling more books. And so I sort of was like, I'm not submitting this unless we move 600 hours over to this publisher and then wouldn't come with the new one and that was that was in terms of sales that was like the peak of my career thus far I always have to put in that caveat because there's always hope you know but um um this would have been 2013 and I mean I just had these months that I never dreamed of I, I that book came out in April I believe and like April and May was something like made ten thousand dollars in April and seventeen thousand in May as a lot more money than I was making at the Billings Gazette, and I was having to work a lot harder for it at the Gazette. And I just kind of thought, you know, this is if I'm ever gonna like try it, this is gonna be this is gonna be the one. So I was with them for two more books, and it was fine. You know, they they produced good books. I enjoyed my time there and I just I have this weird thing where I want collaboration but I also don't want anybody else owning me and so um I just didn't want to do that anymore I didn't want to be with that publisher anymore plus I was I was starting to look askance at what was happening at you know independent bookstores and the way it's, it's such a tough one. You know, it's hard to put the onus on authors. Authors just want their work out there. So it's hard to tell an author, listen, you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't want Amazon sales. It's like, I want sales, but, but if, but if I could call the shots and say where the sales were going to happen, they would happen at independent bookstores. It just means too much to the culture, to the town, you know, every dollar right. that you circulate within your own town comes back to you in much bigger ways than it ever does at target.com or wherever. And so, um, so yeah, we did, a, did a couple of books on my own. Um, uh, Elisa and I wrote one together, which was a romantic comedy, which was totally her, her genre. And thank God I had her, um, to, uh, to guide me through that. Um, and, uh, so now we're up to the book that's coming out in May, which I sort of feel like is book one of part two of my career. Uh -huh. You know, like I've had this, had this experience and, and I was really looking for a publisher and, but not, not sort of a, oh, you know, here's, here's the editorial person you're handed off to, but somebody with whom I could, you know, get down you know, get down to the details with and really, you know, have a simpatico thing going on. And I found that I've, I'm enormously happy. I can't wait to see how this book does. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm in this interesting place where I'm sort of divorced from the, from the expectations, which I probably had earlier in my career. Like, 
oh, I really need this to fly. I really need this to take off. So many factors that affect that that we have zero control over. So I'm much more about sit in there, do the do the work as well as I can do it when I'm doing it, and then just know that a lot of variables are going to swallow up that book. And yeah. you know, so so I'm in a good place uh, for this for this new new wave of work. You know, I'm 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 not. I'm not as ambitious sales-wise as I was when I was a younger writer, but I'm more um, sort of keyed into the larger ecosystem of what it is to be an author and to uh, and to and to um, you know have that symbiotic relationship with other writers, which I wasn't always so good at, and um, with the sellers of the work. So you know, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> that's a really good thing for um, debut authors to hear that it is totally about the journey and it is a long, long journey with a lot of ups and downs. And I've, I've been through some similar things and God, I, I'm starting my 10th book now, which seems insane. Yeah. And what I've realized is that uh, the reward truly is in the work. I mean, yeah. if you're gonna hang your whole writer ego on sales or reviews or anything, uh, good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. if, if you're lucky, the good reviews come and the good sales come. But if you're really lucky, the thing you do is something you said, um, Keith McCafferty, who writes those wonderful fly fishing novels over in Bozeman, said once his mantra is each a book a year and each book better than the one before. Yeah. And I think each book better than the one before is, is the thing I hold on to. It's, it's like you said, you don't look back because right. you know, that way lies madness, but right. you look ahead and think, okay, here's this thing I can do a little better in this book that will maybe connect with people a little more. That'll just kick it up to the next level. And you don't get that if you don't hang in. Yeah. Well, one of the great benefits of, of getting older, and I'm, I'm sure this is true um, just in general life, but in the writing life, for sure, I found it to be true, is um, I've had to get comfortable with what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, and which of those things I can improve and which I should just let go that, you know, it's just not, it's just not in my, I, to use a term I hate, it's not in my skill set, you know. <laughs> Um, I always, I, I edit sports copy for a living and skill set is a big word. And, and I always, I always tell people, which probably annoys them, but I go, remember a skill set is just skills in a nice leather pouch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really had to like, be okay with the things that I enjoyed and didn't enjoy. For instance, I would love to enjoy um book festivals but i do not <laughs> i i don't i don't uh, some of the some of the longest hours of my life have been spent in the bar in missoula trying to escape a, a gripe session about our publishers um <laughs> so um so um i'll still go to some but i but i think i will really tailor my experience to the parts of them that I'm, that I enjoy and forget the parts that I don't. Like when the time comes for everybody to go to the bar, I'll go find a friend in Missoula and go have dinner if we can ever do those things again, right? And, um, and I really love, I really love traveling with a book. I like, I like going to, uh, you know, tiny library in Name Your Town. Um, I, which is, it's funny that I do like that and I don't like book festivals, you know. Maybe it's all the authors who show up at book festivals. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, and I really love the work. I mean, the work is the best part of it. Um, and it, and I love how it develops in stages where it's you and an idea and then it's you and the keyboard. And then you start trusting what you're doing enough to start bringing uh, confidants or your editor into it. And then it starts feeling more like a living thing. And, and then you get to the editorial process. And because I was, I have been an editor for all these years, 
I don't chafe at that, you know. I uh, I love to be edited, which you know a lot of writers do. Um, and um, I always, you know, even when I'm badly edited, it's instructive. You know, I I send back a lot of notes of no, we're going to leave it the way it is, but you know, it, it still. I think that's the journalist in both of us. Yeah. Because I, I likewise enjoy the editing. I, I hate writing the first draft. I mean, it is like pulling out every single fingernail with pliers in slow motion. Right. You know, and I then throwing the alcohol on it or something. But revisions, yeah. once I've got that first draft, then I just love them. I love um, revisions too. Yeah. I, I, I do love the final dash in the first draft where you know. Right. Where you know you've got it. Right. You're like, you know, this thing's going to end, right? Yeah. It's the murky middle. It's, it's, say, uh, it's just, it takes so long to get a thousand them. words and no idea how you're getting where you're going. Right. Uh, that's the worst. The middle's kind of a nightmare. Yeah. Um, well, both of us were in journalism, left journalism, back, back in, in journalism. journalism. What the heck? <laughs> um, I never lost my love for it. I got a little beaten down by the business aspects of newspapering, which is what I was in for yeah. 25 years. Um, but I love the work. I love taking a piece of writing and making it better or showing somebody, you know, I get to work with a lot of young writers, which is really awesome because they've got tons of energy. And, you know, in some cases, in some cases, they have tons to learn, but in other cases, they're teaching me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that. I, I love taking a piece of writing and working collaboratively with somebody. So, did we want to take some questions? Was, just uh, looking at the time and thinking this is the perfect time for it. I'd love to yeah. hear some questions. So Mark Taylor, at this point, people would need to put on their cameras and Microphones, yeah. Yes. Okay. That would be the thing to do. <laughs> or type a question in the comments, either one. We can read them and, and share with the class. Yeah. Either which way. It's a no judgment zone. Oh, Raise I should, your hand. <laughs> I should say, um, oh, you want to hear about the new book? I, I, that's a great question. Thank okay, you. well, I want to leave most of that field open to Lou when he shows up, but um, I can tell you um, it is fundamentally um, a um, father-daughter story, which is interesting because I've never been. Lou is here, okay. Um, I've never been a father to anybody, much less a daughter. <laughs> um, um, and Lou, uh, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to, clear the floor quickly here because Lou had a wonderful um, observation about this. Um, he said something to me in the early stages about how, you know, I, had, I ended up quite unintentionally writing the kind of father-daughter story that isn't often seen in a book. And so I'll let him, uh, I'll let him, can we ring him in, Mark? We can. Yeah. Let's see. He just needs to. Okay. There he hey, is. Hey, there we are. Okay. Oh. I'm gonna shut down everybody else's uh, camera, or maybe just ask you guys to turn it off, and then uh, we'll just get the three of them on. Okay. Okay. Well, this is. Lou, Veronica, my uh, my publisher, coming to us from Stamford, Connecticut. Um, Welcome from Stamford. Welcome yes, from two hours yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm just going to let you take it away. What you want to tell folks about, uh, and it will be a beautiful life. Uh, yeah, well, you 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 led with that uh, that that great observation that I made that I, I was trying <laughs> to remember what it was, but uh, but the um, no, but the the relationship that Craig writes about in this novel. I mean, there are many relationships in this novel, which is why it's such a, a wonderful novel. But the the relationship that that I found was the freshest relationship 
um, and one that is not terribly often ex explored in, in, uh, in fiction um, is the, a relationship that, that largely shifts, a father-daughter relationship that largely shifts after adulthood. Um, that the, um, that the, the relationship that, um, that the main character has with his daughter up until the point when she's an adult is a, a kind of prefab relationship that, that, uh, that people have when they, or that, that fathers especially have when they, they uh, sort of lock their children into a, 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 a very uh, young age uh, level. And, and, and what is stunning about this novel and, and what is really dramatic about this novel is that we're witnessing the moment in this novel where the main character finally comes to see his relationship with his daughter become an adult relationship for the first time. Um, and that's not, um, that, that is not nearly as often written about. Uh, there, that, that relationship, the mother-daughter relationship, that the mother-daughter version of that relationship is, is well chronicled in fiction, but the, uh, the father-daughter relationship is, is not. Um, and, and it was the dramatic linchpin of the entire novel. Which I, I'm not sure I even realized as I was going along. I remember we had conversations about, you know, what's happening here. <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, I, you know, it's funny because I think it, it had to be that way. It was, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have had a story if, if, if not for that, you wouldn't have had a story because then there wouldn't have been any place for, for the main character to move. But, but because you, you had that, and I think you, you probably wrote it that way because you knew that that was what was going to make it a story. And, right. and I think what you, you, you encountered was something that um, is, very, uh, is a very challenging thing for most fathers to deal with. Um, I've, I'm, I'm the father of, uh, of, a, of a full adult, adult daughter and, and of, uh, of one who's uh, well on her way to adulthood. Um, and, and I can tell you, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge to, to start thinking of your, your, your daughters, especially, um, as, um, as, as not only adults, but adults who might have a better sense of what you should be doing with your life than, uh, <laughs> than you have, which of course is another, another fulcrum point for, for this novel, because, uh, Max does, uh, does, it does, you know, one of the things that I, I said to Craig when, um, when I read the first draft of this novel and and went back and and looked at some of Craig's earlier novels is that he writes um, he writes crossroads really really well, you know and and that's a that's a great thing it, it's a great talent to have, you know because um, it's it's easy to create crossroads uh, in fiction you know it's essentially creating conflict but to actually make it feel real and actually to 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 make some observations that that make the reader stop um, is is a rare skill and and uh, and there are some key crossroads moments in, in this novel that that Craig has, has completely mastered well I think I can I wouldn't be giving too much away to tell people that the book opens with this main character max he's a he's a pipeline guy he does what I do on the pipeline. He tracks a tool through the line from one end to the other. And um, he's in the Minneapolis airport about to miss a flight that is going to put him in a very tough position with his wife. And uh, what was so much fun about conceiving it in that moment, like here's where we start is, um, you know, it allowed a lot of what I think were the parts of the book that I like best. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say what anybody else is going to like best, but, you know, the humor, the, you know, his, his sort of sad sackness, but, <laughs> but he's also, but he's not an idiot, you know, he's, he's, he's semi aware of what's going on and what's happening to him. He just yeah, doesn't I think... really know, you know. Yeah, I, I think what what's fascinating about 
what happens to him as, as a character is that um, he thinks where he is is fine. You know, he's not he's not he's not thrilled with his life but he's not disenchanted with his life and the first big revelation that he he needs to come to is that he's not fine (laughs) and 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 then it allows him to sort of move in a direction toward fine which i think is uh you know it's a it's a it's a fascinating place for a story to start because you know you don't have somebody who's who's tortured or or troubled at the beginning of the story. Um, he sort of becomes troubled when he realizes he sh- should have been troubled all along. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's and it's funny because I was, I mean, I'm, I remember writing those opening chapters and thinking, well, I'm doing kind of what I advise people to do when they ask me, you know, how do I write a novel? Which you know, good grief, I don't know, <laughs> you know, but is is you know, I always, I was always fascinated by the advice of start as close to the end of it as you possibly can, Mm. you know, and, uh, and it felt like he was, he was close to the end there, you know, yeah, which, which is funny, because he's got a long way to go, but, you know, yeah, yeah, so, no, I, I, um, yeah, I, I was, you know, extremely moved by, you know, watching him experience his life in some ways for the very first time, yeah. Yeah. Because because I do think that that's that's the other thing that's that's um, that's fascinating about this character is that he's managed to get by with very little self observation for a really long time, um, and yet isn't cowed by coming to terms with the fact that he, he he actually has to start examining his life. Yeah. And he actually kind of grooves on it. Not without complications. Not <laughs> no. without drama. There's no, plenty no. of drama. <laughs> you gotta have it. You gotta have it. Um, gosh, does uh, anybody have any questions? Do we wanna we wanna do that in our remaining eight minutes? There's a question in the comments or in yeah. the chat. Uh, what gave you the idea for this book, having never been a, a father or a daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Wait, I didn't say I'd never been a daughter. Uh, no. Um, uh, uh, every book, uh, every book is different, but every book is also the same in that it always starts with a character. You know, it, for me, it always starts with a character, much more than a situation or or even having some idea of what the resolution is and then trying to back construct it. Um, you know, Max, I just started thinking about Max, you know, before he was even Max. You know, that was funny is, you know, he ends up, he ends up having this whole German heritage that I never, you know, <laughs> his name is Maximilian um, Heinrich, I believe, went. Yeah, I mean, it's just, and I didn't know any of that, you know, I just... I just had a guy who was about to miss a flight in Minneapolis and have to sleep on the floor, which I've done. Um, and, uh, you know, and then another guy showed up and, you know. Well, what uh, about that guy, Craig? Because that, that's an interesting character also. You know, the, I mean, the other, the other major relationship in this novel is, is, between, is yeah. between Max and, and the guy he meets at the airport when he misses his flight. Yeah, he meets a fellow traveler who walks up on him and starts talking to him and sort of worms his way into Max's life. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I should admit, admit this or not, but uh, there were a couple of junctures where I was writing the book and I told Elisa, my wife, I was reading chapters to her, which is a relatively new thing, you know. It used to be we were both really secretive about our work, and we would read it to each other when it came out, and it had a barcode on it. And, um, but I was reading chapters to her, and there were a couple of, couple of chapters with the friend, the unexpected friend, who, where I just started bawling when I was reading this to her, and I knew, and, and 
I don't even like to say that about my own work, but I knew I had something when I was reacting to it that way. And she was, I mean, Elisa can probably verify this or, or tell me that I got it completely wrong, but uh, you know, but when I was having emotional, when I was having emotional reactions to things as I was writing them, I thought, well, this can't be, you know, <laughs> this could be a lot of things, but it ain't bad. So. <laughs> Do you do you find that? Do you find if you if you connect really strongly emotionally with a character that that means you're on it? I think so. I think so. Yeah. I I um you know well you know what I'm working on now and trying to resolve how I feel about yeah a certain guy. I think you and I are you and I are in two he different places. There who, uh, yeah. Speaking, yeah, yeah. You you and I are in two different places on him right now, so we got. <laughs> well, kinda, you're further along in the novel than I've seen. So. Yeah, yeah, but no, I you know, it's it's when I feel the empathy thing, even if I don't feel, even if I don't feel love, you know. I mean, even if it's hate, you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I I love it when people say to say to me, I, I really do. Like, I've had a few people, especially with the book we've been talking about, the Summer Sun, who said. You know, I just hated that book. <laughs> and and I say, you are welcome for that authentic emotional experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, Jill Rupert wants to know when the book comes out. That'd be uh, early May. Yep. May. May 11th, I think. 11th, May 11th, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, in hardcover, um, wherever good books are sold. Yeah. Yeah. If I may chime in, just because you... <laughs> You brought me into it. <laughs> um, it the, the nice thing about when you read to me is that I get to I get to have two experiences. I get to have your experience reading the book to me, obviously, and then I get to have the experience of reading the book. And so especially with that particular relationship that you were talking about with this friend. It's very, it was very much, I think, and I'm not crying, you're crying <laughs> experience <laughs> right. with it, which was great. And it was great for us both to experience that at the same time as you were developing that and drafting it and seeing how it shaped along the way. So that, yeah. was, that was a great experience for me. Well, without being too awfully therapeutic about it, um, I think... I think male friendship is a really important thing. You know, like all the best developed men I know, um, you know, most fully formed men I know have some really grounded, honest, emotional experiences with other, gu other guys, yep. you know? And, um, and so it was great that that sort of manifested itself. Uh, like I see Bob Kempton's here. You know, Bob Kimpton's probably my guy in that regard. Like, um, you know, it just, there's nothing that we can't talk about. And, and you know, the larger, the larger story with men is they really got to talk to some people. <laughs> you know, like, like the, almost the whole story of what's going on in the world today is guys need to, you know, Come on, man! You got to talk to somebody because because <laughs> the way you're handling it is is not working for any of us. So um, yeah, so it was fun. It was fun to bring that to the book. Was that it? Anybody else? I would love to answer one more question before we. Oh, Daniel Rice. I'm sorry. Oh, that we did get to your question. Yeah, there you go. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming out. And Gwen, thank you. I I, I can't thank you enough for um, um, reading that book again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, you know, even great. I didn't do that. Um, so 
And we're, it's like our own little mini writers conference. We don't have to like worry about big crowds and being social. We get to talk about writing for an hour. And that is just a terrific I broke, privilege. I broke out a beer. Yeah. Ah, I, I I'm about to earlier. do that. I forgot, I forgot that I had it. So, um, but uh, no, I want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, and uh, I should say before we turn this off, Mark, um, if you if you go to this house of books on on the web, and uh, and purchase one of my books, and you uh, put in the note that you were on the Zoom call, um, they'll they'll knock ten percent off of it. Um, I it's not so much my book. I don't care whose books you buy, but please 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 send uh, this house of books some business. Um, uh, bookstores everywhere need it, and. Uh, and it's up to us to keep that culture alive and going. So, um, so that's that's the secret code. Is you know uh, Julie Schultz of uh, this house of books told me, you know you can write. I was on the Zoom. Uh, you can write. Uh, you know Craig is a jerk. You can write whatever you want to write. Um, but if you do that on a uh, if you do that on a on a book one of my books they'll they'll knock. They'll knock a percentage off. So great. Mark, thanks for hosting. Yeah, hey. thank you, Mark. And thanks so much for uh for joining us. This is just great. It's been a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Pleasure. See everybody later. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. bye.